As victims of the post office scandal await swift exoneration and compensation from the government, the public inquiry into what led to their convictions resumed today. Some of those wrongfully convicted were in the room as post office investigator Stephen Bradshaw gave evidence. He's been employed at the company since 1978 and was involved in the investigation into nine sub postmasters. He told the inquiry he was not told about any bugs in the 40 Horizons IT accounting system and was not technically minded to be able to question it. Bradshaw also admitted a written statement he had signed declaring the post office's absolute confidence in the IT system was put together by lawyers and not by him. So you've there said in a witness statement uh, that the post office continues to have absolute confidence in the robustness and integrity of its Horizon system. Um, having given the evidence that you've just given about your lack of knowledge of the system, your your lack of knowledge of technical matters, do you think it was appropriate for you to write that in a witness statement that there, the post office has absolute confidence in the robustness and integrity of the Horizon system? I was given that statement by Cartwright King and told to put that statement through. Were you aware that the contents of your witness statement that we've seen reflected there was drafted uh, by, among other people, the head of PR at the post office? Not at all. All I seen was the final version when it came from Cartwright King. Uh, and do you think it was appropriate for your witness statement to have been drafted in the way that it was? No, no not really, no. Joining me in the studio now, Talk TV's political correspondent, Alicia Fitzgerald. Hello, Alicia. And lawyer Joshua Rosenberg. Casey, good to see you, Joshua. Let's, let's go straight into this. A witness statement. I, I had thought, call me ignorant and naive, I've been called a great deal worse and quite recently many things, much worse than that, but, but I had thought that a witness statement had to be the actual statement of the person making it. I had not known that witness statements could be dictated by firms of lawyers or PR people or indeed anyone else. I thought it had to come from the heart, the soul of the person making the statement. And you're absolutely right, Vanessa. Ah. It, you're absolutely right. A witness statement is the words of the witness. Now, all right, they can be drafted so they're clear, they're not uh, repetitious, and crucially, they don't include uh, information that's not appropriate to the case. Mm. But you certainly can't get away with saying, well, I didn't write this and somebody gave it to me and told me to sign it. Lawyers advise, they don't tell people what to do. They can, as I say, they can, they can advise, but they don't uh, instruct witnesses to what to say. On the contrary, it's the witnesses who are meant to instruct their lawyers to draft a statement which summarises what they wish to say. So what if, and I'm only positing the question and the theory, I'm just asking, I'm not saying this happened, but what if post office staff were told right, you've got to make a witness statement and we're going to tell you what to say and that law firm that he keeps mentioning, they, they will provide you with it and that is what you will say. If the post office did instruct their employees to do that, to have witness statements um, you know, written for them by firms of lawyers and then to, 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 to sign them as if they were saying that themselves, is that, is that against the law to do that? Well, it's certainly not the way to behave, is it? Mm. Um, you, as an investigator, should say what you saw. Now, as you rightly said, this man has been working for the post office for 45 years. Yeah. I dare say he started as some sort of counter clerk mm -hmm. and he's moved up in the system and he's been part of the post office all his working life. I don't suppose, well, we know he wasn't trained as an investigator in some outside organisation like the police, like a private security firm, before he joined the post office. I don't think he is familiar with how investigators work elsewhere. I don't think he's familiar with the concept that you and I in the outside world know about questioning what people tell us and only doing what we think is appropriate according to our job. He's acting as if he's simply doing what his... Um, bosses told him to, his lawyers told him to, and so on. If you were to ask the lawyers, they would say, no, we only advise. We didn't tell him what to do. Uh, and he's saying, well, I just did what I was told. Now, it's this culture within the post office where you've had these long-serving employees who haven't thought independently about how things are done with, within the outside world uh, that I think is one of the problems. And what if I said we all 
know that you know it's it's some, sometimes easier and sometimes your job depends upon doing what you're told to do but we all also know that if we're anywhere near the legal system and we're making a, a, a statement or we're bearing witness or whatever it is we're doing whether we're on or off oath and we're signing our names to something we ought to a understand what we're signing I think we all know that we all know that when it comes to signing a, a mortgage thing or a rent agreement or anything else we have to know what we're doing we're supposed to read it we're meant to understand it. And if we're going to sign it, it better be what we really think and what we believe has occurred. We can't just sign any old thing. And if you don't do that, you find yourself being questioned at an inquiry like this today. Yeah, so what are the possible repercussions or ramifications if the post office instructed their employees to sign you know, statements constructed for them by lawyers, or if indeed the employees deliberately obfuscated, pretended they didn't understand, said they didn't, said that there was only one person to whom this was happening when actually it was happening to hundreds and hundreds of people and they were aware of this. What happens if there's been deliberate deliberate lying, deliberate deceit, deliberate constructing of a false scenario? I suppose one would like to say that, you know, bosses will be in trouble. Mm. But I think the serious, realistic answer to your question is you simply need to start with a wholly new structure. You need independent people who've been brought in from outside, who are familiar with current practice. You need uh, to separate the investigation arm from the prosecution arm. Post Office gave up bringing its own prosecutions in 2015, and rightly so. Mm. You need a much more independent a system with checks and balances, you really need to start again. Uh, Alicia, what is, do you think, the government's appetite for bringing the perpetrators to book on this one? So, so we know that there is now an appetite for exoneration, thank goodness for that. We know there's an appetite for compensation, and quite rightly so. But what about punishment, making the punishment fit the crime? What about those who were responsible for this? Because there's definitely been some kind of element of collusion, of, of obfuscation, of deception. What about those people? Well, this is it. It's really interesting because at that inquiry today, we've had another person kind of just say that they didn't really know what was going on. We've had politicians say, it. And now we have the post office's fraud investigator also saying that he simply didn't have any idea. So at the moment, there's just a bit of a grey area about who exactly knew what at what time. And I think until we actually really nail that down and work out at what point who was responsible for what, mm -hmm. it's going to be really hard to punish people because we just don't know who is being truthful. We don't know who is just trying to kind of get themselves out of this. Mm. And we don't know who actually had the information that things were going wrong at at what time. So I think until then, the government have a bit of a task. We have to also remember that pretty much all political parties have a hand to play in this as well. And that is something that's going to make this a bit more difficult for them because they don't obviously want to put their hands up and say, this was partially my fault as well uh, as that. So there's a lot at play here. And to be quite honest, there are a lot of people to blame for it as well. But until we have that nailed down, until we have the evidence, mm -hmm. it's really hard to actually punish people. And, and let's ask Joshua Rosenberg about this. How much of a legal defence is it to say, although my job was fraud inspector, I didn't really know there was a fraud. I wasn't aware of it. I didn't know, no one told me, I didn't realise. If you're being paid to be that, and if that's your job, is it a defence to say, ah, I didn't know, no one told me, I didn't realise? Uh, it's not a very good defence, is it? Uh, you know, you, if you're an investigator, you ought to understand the principles of investigation, disclosure of information where appropriate, and you ought to understand the legal process that results from your investigation. Yes. And if you have suspicions that the evidence you have uncovered is unreliable because the computer is unreliable, then of course you should make that clear. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't hide anything. Uh, and so, you know, what are the consequences? Well, ultimately you lose your job, one hopes. Um, but, um, you know, is it a criminal offence to do your job badly? Well, perhaps not. Right, interesting. And, and what about Fujitsu in all of this? Because we know that the government's heavily involved with them in all sorts of technical systems permeating civil service and well beyond. So there's the tentacles are so completely entwined that they're said to be inextricably joined forever or whatever it is. But can they not, you know, demand compensation, demand that Fujitsu pay up and also to to, to, to bring to book the, 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 the staff members of Fujitsu who are responsible for this and knew what the hell they were doing? Certainly, as far as staff members are concerned, we shall be seeing people giving evidence to Sir Wynne Williams' public inquiry uh, in, in the next few weeks and months. Mm. 
Uh, as far as Fujitsu as a company is concerned, yes, the government certainly is looking to claim compensation because, after all, it's paying out all this money to the postmasters. Yeah. Um, but you're absolutely right. Uh, uh, Fujitsu is running the Horizon system. Um, well, the government says it wants to have a new company to run it, but it will take many years to set up a new system. So in the meantime, they have to keep using Fujitsu to keep the system running because you can't just stop it. So it is difficult. On the other hand, you do see companies charged by the serious fraud office uh, with fraud who say, look, I'm prepared to make a clean breast of it. I'm prepared to put my house in order. I am prepared to pay uh, a compensation in exchange for not being prosecuted. Now, I'm not suggesting for a moment that Fujitsu is gu guilty of fraud, mm. but it is sometimes uh, considered appropriate for a company to say, look, we got this wrong, we've charged a lot of money, we'll give some of it back. Yes, and, 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 and the appetite at Fujitsu, is anything filtering through to you, uh, Alicia, about what the feeling is? Because we've been told, haven't we, that the, culturally the Japanese sense of honour is in, enormously finely honed and this is a shaming thing and any sense of shame is something obviously that Japanese shun even more kind of obviously and overtly than we might shun it, although I don't suppose we like it much either. Um, that kind of thing. Do we know anything? What's Fujitsu saying, if anything? Well, something else has emerged which is quite damaging for the government, and that is that £4.9 billion worth of government contracts have been issued to Fujitsu since the 2019 court appeal that said that Horizon uh, technology system was flawed, it had bugs, it wow. had all of this, and the government still kept awarding them contracts. £3.6 billion of that was since Rishi Sunak became the Chancellor and now the Prime Minister. So it's a really sticky one, clearly, because they've still awarded all of these contracts and there's no way they can really turn around and say they had no idea there was a clear court appealing and it was very clear exactly what the court said mm -hmm. and, and they've still awarded them contracts. So there's a lot of anger, definitely, in Westminster from those who weren't actually involved in awarding the contracts, those who weren't at the front bench, those who aren't in government, in just saying that actually this is really not good and it reflects so badly on politicians. Yes, and Finally, because we have Joshua Rosenberg here, a man of such sagacity, I don't want him to leave <laughs> without just answering very simply one question. And this is not particularly a legal question, it's much more a kind of personal intellectual kind of question and, and philosophical question. What do you feel about the fact that it has taken an ITV drama, so a fictionalised account of something that happened, to bring public consciousness to this peak so that the government is now peaked into acting like this. The fact that it's taken a telly show to do this, how do you feel about that? It is extraordinary, isn't it? I mean, I've written occasional pieces about it. Nick Wallace, who's on your yeah. show later on today,